chapter 1, verse 24, the book of Genesis. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the cattle according to their kinds, and everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make men in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created men in his own image, in the image of God he created him male and female he created them and God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth and God said behold I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bed of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed men of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Authorized version has a living soul, but I'll point out why this has a living being later. I'm glad you weren't put off by a bit of hard thinking last Sunday night. I warn you that I'm afraid tonight again we're going to have to use this up here and love God with all our minds. We're looking at Genesis chapter 1. A fortnight ago I spoke about what this chapter says about God. Then last Sunday night I was looking at the subject, what does Genesis 1 tell us about the world in which we live? Now tonight our subject is, what does Genesis 1 tell us about men, about ourselves? I suppose that one of the deepest questions you can ever ask, and one of the most important is, what is men? And to give you only one illustration of the importance of asking and answering this question, it was the answer of a German philosopher Nietzsche to that question, what is men, that led ultimately to the Second World War, for it was the philosophy that the fascist party of Germany accepted. In asking this question, what is men, you are really going to shape your attitude to life, to other people. Indeed, if you go back to the original question, where did man come from, you are likely also to answer the question, where is he going to? And to ask where man came from is to answer the question, what is he? Because if you can find where we started, you'll find what kind of creature we are. Now this raises, of course, the question of evolution which to the scientist seems to be a sacred cow and to the Christian a bogeyman. And in between the two we are often terribly torn. I'm sure you've heard of the story of the ape sitting in a rather moody 
way in the corner of his cage in London Zoo and bothering himself over the question, am I my keeper's brother? Well, now, this is the question. <laughs> and I'm afraid we've got to tackle this head on. And I want to be utterly frank with you and tell you how my own thinking has uh, developed on this very important subject. If you don't feel it's important, if you're not interested in your ancestry, then, as I said last Sunday night, you shut off and have a rest. But it is a very important distinction. You see, hitherto, men assumed, at least in the West, on the basis of the Bible, that man started at the top and has in fact fallen and is heading rapidly for the level of the beasts. It's a completely opposite viewpoint to believe that man started with the beasts and instead of belonging to a fallen race, we do in fact belong to a rising race which in the words of Edmund Leach in the Lord Wreath Lectures over the radio last year said this, men have become like gods and we must now exercise our divinity. Now here are the two views and they are so diametrically opposed that I think you can understand why there was such a very hot debate between Christians and evolutionaries during the 19th century and into the 20th. Well now the Bible puts man in his rightful place. He gives him his right connections so to speak and I want to look at man's connections in three directions. First, man's material connections, his material connections. Second, man's animal connections. Third, man's eternal connections. And I'm going to ask under each head just how closely is man connected? Or perhaps he's quite distinct, we shall see. Take first the material connections of man. A famous surgeon once said that as part of his student research he dissected a human body to its last little piece and he found no soul. He said this publicly later. Well, I'm not surprised. I wouldn't have expected him to. I remember 20 years ago I went on an evangelistic mission with Dr. Donald Soper as he was then, Lord Soper as he is now, and I remember in one open air meeting, he was asked two questions and these were his replies, which I think were quite brilliant, as he can be. The first question was, what shape is your soul? And he replied, oblong. Now that is a very profound answer and in fact it's the biblical one. And the next question that came was, where is the soul in the body? And he said, where the music is in the organ. And this again was a profound and scriptural answer. You see, if you took this organ to pieces and said, I didn't find any music in it, you'd be a fool. And that's precisely what that surgeon was when he said, I took that body to bits and I didn't find any soul. You see, it does not say in Genesis 1 that God took a body and made a body and then took a soul and then put them together and put the soul somewhere in the body. He said he took the dust of the earth, and he breathed into that dust, and man became a living soul. In other words, my soul is oblong. You're looking at my oblong soul tonight. I am a living soul, and I'm oblong. And when I'm buried, it'll be in an oblong grave in an oblong box. When you begin to approach the question like this, you'll begin to understand some very profound things about men. I want to pinpoint two phrases in the Genesis account of man, one in chapter 1, one in chapter 2. Take the second first. This phrase, the dust of the earth. I'm sure you've heard of the little girl who asked her mother what it meant in the Bible, dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. And after her mother explained, she said, well, there's somebody coming or going under the spare room bed. <laughs> well, we are dust and we return to it. And it's very important to remember that every particle of your body can be found somewhere in the crust of the earth. It cuts you down to size. It keeps us humble. Our material connections are with the dust of the earth. Do you know what the word Adam means in Hebrew? Mud. That's what it means. 
dust that has been stuck together. That's where the name man comes from, Adam, mud. And it is very healthy to remember that every part of my body could be found somewhere on the earth's surface. And it's a truism now. I don't know if the value still holds. I would think with devaluation we'd have to alter the figure. But I think most of us have heard people say that if you were sold on the open market in your constituent chemical parts, you would realize about seven and six. Which is yet another way of seeing the difference between looking at someone scientifically and looking at them spiritually. Scientifically, I'm worth seven and six. The chemicals of my body. Doesn't make me feel terribly important or very valuable. But spiritually, God loved me enough to send his son to this earth to die for me. You see the difference again. But the Bible never glosses over the fact that you are dust, and to dust you will return. And someday those words will be said over you, dust to dust, earth to earth, ashes to ashes. You go back to where you came from. But that is not the whole story. The second phrase I want to point out when we're thinking of man's material connections is this phrase, a living soul. Unfortunately, we can't get out of our minds some ideas about souls that we got from somewhere else than the Bible, namely from ancient Greece, which is still the basis of our thinking and our education. And in ancient Greece, they thought of the soul as something like this, that you popped inside a body and could pop out again later. There was no real connection to the two. It was like a letter in an envelope, and the letter was the important thing, and the envelope, when it was finished, was gone. Or to use their own illustration, they thought of the soul in the body as water in a glass, just like this. The soul was the water, the glass is your body. One day, said the Greeks, the water will be poured back into the ocean. Your soul will be poured back into God. The glass will be smashed. Your body will be finished. And never again shall the two meet. And that is why the Greeks could not see that you would know anybody in the life after death. That's why they couldn't have any real understanding of people being people the other side of the grave. And ultimately, if you go around the Greek cemeteries and read the tombstones, you'll find that there are depressing inscriptions on all of them. Well, now, that was their idea, and we cannot get it out of our minds. But it says, man became a living soul when God breathed into the dust of the earth. What you may not have realized is this, that in Genesis 1, animals are called living souls as well. The word soul applies as much to my dog as to me, according to Genesis 1 and 2. My dog is a living soul, and I am a living soul. The word soul in the Bible means life, which is why if I'm on a ship that's going down in the ocean, I send out a message, S-O-S, -S, save our souls. And that's precisely the biblical meaning of the term. I'm not meaning send for Billy Graham, I'm saying send the lifeboat. And by my soul, I mean my life. I have a body, and when God breathes, that body comes alive. It is now a living soul. Mind you, I'm going to say later that men have a spirit. But that's a different thing from what we understand by soul. Animals are living souls. Men are living souls. A body that has been made of the dust of the earth and made alive by God's activity. Well, now, this raises the second question. What are man's animal connections? Am I beginning to imply already that man and the animals are closely related because the Bible calls them both living souls? And I don't know if it was the first time you ever realized that the Bible calls animals souls. Well, now, let's look at the animal connections and this bogey of evolution. It is not a new idea. Do you know the first man to think of it? He was a man called Aristotle, and he lived centuries and centuries and centuries ago. People think Charles Darwin was the first to think of it. He was nothing of the sort. His grandfather wrote a book, Erasmus Darwin. His grandfather wrote a book about evolution long before Charles did. Charles made it popular. And indeed, there were many others before Charles Darwin 
who in fact spoke of this, but he was the one who really made the idea popular. Now what do I mean by evolution? I mean this, I'm defining it like this. Evolution is the progressive development in forms of life from the simple to the complex. Now, I'm sorry if that sounds a bit of a mouthful, but that's what I'm working with. By evolution I mean progressive development in forms of life from one to the other, from the simple to the complex. That's what most people understand by it. Don't worry if you don't get the definition. Now I think you can never think straight about evolution unless you separate it into two questions. Question number one, has there been evolution among the plants and the animals? And that is a separate question to the second which is, has there been evolution from the animals to men? Now I would like to separate these two questions because they need to be tackled in a different way in a different, with a different approach. Evolution among the plants and the animals as one subject, forgetting all about men for a moment, and then evolution in men. Let me talk first about evolution among the plants and the animals and point out that Charles Darwin worked exclusively in this field. Charles Darwin was the grandson of Josiah Wedgwood, of whom you may have heard in other connections. And Charles Darwin was destined for the ministry in the church and he went to Cambridge and studied theology. And but for a few strange circumstances, Charles Darwin would have been the Reverend Charles Darwin and would never have taught evolution because he wouldn't have had the chance to come to study it. But at the end of his course at Cambridge in theology, his interest in nature became too great for him to proceed with that course and he began to study biology and natural history. And in 1831 he set off on the good ship HMS Beagle to go round the world on that little ship studying plants and animals. And he noticed on islands off the south continent of America certain species of plants and animals which he'd also noticed on the mainland and he naturally began to ask, how did they get there? He spent 20 years studying plants and animals, not men, plants and animals, and finally wrote the book which we now know as Origin of Species. And he came to the conclusion, and I state his conclusion, that the various species of plants and animals were not independently created, but descended from other species. Now until he wrote that book, nearly everybody thought that God created the daisies, the lilies separately and the, I'm not very good on flowers, I better go on to animals, that he created the pigs separately and the horses separately and the cows, quite distinct from each other. And what he was saying is that these could have come from other types of animal and indeed two different kinds of animal could have come from the same kind originally. That was his basic idea and he took it no further than that. Now I want to point out that this idea it was and still is only a theory. It is not yet a proven fact. Any scientist worth his salt will tell you this. And I did have the privilege of studying under Professor Harrison, the leading evolutionist in this country. And he was most careful to drum into us students, this is only a theory. So we're not having to cope with facts, we're having to cope with a theory. It's got a lot of facts behind it, but it's still just a theory. Furthermore, it's many theories because nowadays I find that evolutionists don't agree with Darwin. They have their own approach. So if somebody says to me, what do you think about evolution? I say, do you mean the theory of evolution? And then if they say, yes, what do you think about the theory of evolution? I say, well, there isn't one. Do you mean the theories? of evolution and in this way we sort of move the battle from my court into theirs. Well now it's very important to realize that this was only a theory. Mind you there are many amazing facts to support it. One of which I've been personally involved in myself and that is that in the mining villages of County Durham where the general landscape if you know it tends to black to grey there has appeared a new species of moth which is black to grey. And this I have observed, I've seen it with my own eyes, it wasn't there before. 
It's there now. And there are other examples that I could give from other people's experience in which new species have appeared within our lifetime of plants and animals. And this has all helped to raise the question. Now so far I'm giving you a science lecture. Let me get back to the Bible. What does the Bible say about plants and animals? Does it allow such evolution or does it exclude it? There are two phrases which seem to me key phrases in Genesis 1. Here's the first. Let the earth bring forth plants, herbs, animals. Now that's a very important phrase. It does not say that God made them all at that point, but that the earth did. Now that's a very important phrase. And if you grasp its significance, you'll realize, and I put it quite bluntly, that since there is no mention whatever of how the earth did, I see no difficulty whatsoever in allowing from Genesis 1 that plants and animals evolved. No difficulty at all. Let the earth bring forth of itself, and the earth did, and here we are. And the wonderful variety of plants and animals around us. So on that phrase, I see no difficulty. But if I don't go on to another phrase, someone's going to hold my coat by the lapels afterwards and say, what about? All right, I'm going to deal with it now. The other phrase is, according to their kinds. And many have felt that this phrase does imply that God created each one separately. I want to say that a careful study of the phrase does not imply that at all. What it does mean is this, that God decided before the process began what the end product should be. The phrase according to its kind is not a phrase describing the process, but the product. It's not a phrase describing how things came, but what came as the result. And therefore what I'm saying is this. The two things Genesis 1 does say is this. God started the process of plant and animal life and God decided where it should end, but not a word is said about anything in between. And if science comes up with absolute proof, which it hasn't yet, but if it did, that plant and animal life evolved to its present state, I would have no difficulty at all with the Bible. There would be no contradiction here. And I would be perfectly happy to go on worshipping God, probably with a deeper sense of the amazing wonder of God's creative power to cause a process like that to proceed. Well now the interesting thing is that Charles Darwin remained all his life a believer in God. And I spent this afternoon reading the last chapter of Darwin's Origin of Species. Don't know if you thought that was good Sunday reading or not. Well let me read you a sentence from it to show you that it was very good Sunday reading. Charles Darwin finished, I see no good reason why the views given in this volume should shock the religious feelings of anyone. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or even one. Well, that's a magnificent statement. But do you know that Charles Darwin died of a broken heart? Why? Because within his lifetime he saw atheists and agnostics hail his book as an attack on the biblical doctrine of creation. And the idea which he had formed purely in relation to the study of plant and animal life was taken and applied to man and applied to man in such a way that man didn't need God anymore. And men were saying, we're evolving, we're on the up and up, we're on an escalator that's moving on into utopia. And man has come all the way from the slime, he's going to be God very soon. And you know, when people said that, Charles Darwin broke his heart. And he died of a broken heart. Now, I don't know if you knew all this, but it puts the whole thing in a rather different perspective. Now, you see what I've been tackling so far? I've been looking at the question, was there evolution among the plants and the animals. And I've said two things. I've said that scientifically it looks as if there might have been, though it's not yet proved. Scripturally it is possible and there is nothing in the Bible to deny it. On the contrary, there are some indications that it could well have been. But I think it's wrong for either the interpreter of Scripture 
or the expounder of science to be dogmatic until we have further knowledge. Now I come to a very different question. The question is, if evolution is true of plants and animals, is it also true of men? A little boy walking around London Zoo looked in at the chimpanzee cage, turned to his mother and said, don't those men look like monkeys? Now that was his very simple impression. And it was that observation that first caused people to wonder. There were other factors that made them wonder, the factor of what are called vestigial organs, the parts of your body that are no use to you, your appendix, your little toe. Where did you get these from? And so far scientists have listed 100 parts of your body that you could do without. Where did you get them from? There is the whole study of embryology which means that now we know how the baby forms inside a mother's womb. And during the various stages of that development, during pregnancy, it does seem that there are some extraordinary resemblances to animal development which we leave behind before we're born. The tail is much more prominent in the embryo than in the born and grown and adult human being. Furthermore, the fact that sooner or later we shall have transplanted organs from anthropoid species into men. This is the next thing in surgery and you can expect it any day now. And the fact that already blood transfusions have been experimented with. These have all helped to ask the question did they come separately or have they perhaps come from some common stock? Now let me say straight away that no evolutionist that I know dares to say that man came from the monkeys. What they do say, which is very different and very importantly different, is that man and monkeys may have come from something else. Nobody ever suggested that man came from the apes. But there are the similarities. And this has been emphasized by the fact that there have been discovered traces of beings almost identical in appearance to men who cooked, who buried, who drew pictures and who did a number of things, sorry, who made tools just as man does. Neanderthal man is the outstanding example. I know that one or two were found to be hoaxes, the Piltdown men and the Nebraska men were found to be frauds, but it was science that found that, not scripture. And if you accept that those are frauds, you've got to accept that science says the others are genuine. Now all this has helped to create in people's minds a strong impression that the animals went on developing until one day what we call, call Homo sapiens developed and man was on the earth. Now I've got to ask, is this true? This is the heart of the question. This is why as late as the 1920s there was the famous Stokes trial in America which has now been made into a film with Spencer Tracer as the lawyer who tried to defend the school teacher who was teaching evolution in a school in the Bible Belt in the southern states of America. You've heard the case. Why is it that this is the focal question? Well, as I've said already, so much hangs on it. Is man rising or falling? Did he start at the bottom and is he working to the top or did he start at the top and will he finish at the bottom? This is the big issue. And your whole philosophy of life will hang on this question. Well, may I comment on science first, very briefly. Far, far more than the views on plants and animals, the theory of evolution as applied to men is a theory. One scientist who's not a Christian said in my hearing that 3,000 more missing links would have to be found before science could begin to say this was looking like fact. Now that's a pretty big item of evidence to find. The Reader's Digest World Atlas is interesting here. They have a picture called the Tree of Men and it looks just like a, an ordinary tree with, two, with a trunk growing into two main branches. And on this tree they put little red and blue and green spots for prehistoric men. And then they divide the tree and follow one through to the monkeys and the apes and so on and the other through to men. 
The interesting thing is that from the division down here, right up to man up here, there's nothing. Nothing. Plenty of prehistoric creatures down here, plenty up the left-hand side to the monkeys, but nothing here. I'm intrigued that at the head of it they put a text, and God made men of the dust of the earth. I wouldn't have thought their illustration just illustrated the text, but then some of my illustrations don't either, so I, I mustn't throw bricks. But this is very striking. One side of the tree is blank. It is an act of faith to believe it exists. But I point out that it is faith and not evidence that has caused that diagram to be drawn. And that until they can fill in those 3,000 down that side, nobody has the right to say that man came from the same stock as animals. That's my comment on science. And I've tried to be fair. Furthermore, there is something else that has been discovered in the last two years which throws a disastrous light on this whole theory, and it's this. A lady two years ago went to live with chimpanzees for a year and a half in Africa. And you may have seen the publication that she produced when she came out. Um, she found this, and it has quite shattered the scientific world. She discovered that chimpanzees make tools... Now, I don't know if you realize what an incredible thing that is. But hitherto, whenever a skeleton was dug up that had tools near it, men, animals don't make tools. Now, suddenly, we find that's all wrong. And what we've said was prehistoric men may have been animals and probably were. Now, you see the whole flux into which this has thrown us. And therefore, I would think that for the next few years, scientists will be perhaps a little less dogmatic on this issue because of this discovery. Now let me come to Scripture. What does Scripture say? If you don't remember anything else tonight, remember this sentence. There is no natural bridge between animals and men according to the Bible. There is no natural bridge. That means that animals could never have developed into men by the natural process of evolution. Now, I will stand by that to dooms till doomsday because I think it's absolutely fundamental to the Bible. But I have to face very squarely. Suppose science did discover the 3,000 missing links and I had to look at this. What then? Well, may I look at two possible viewpoints, both of which are now being taught by Christians who believe the Bible to be the word of God. One is this, that in fact God not only took the dust of the earth to make man, but he took the dust of the earth in the form of a developed physical frame. And that then with that he created man in his own image. In other words, he didn't start from nothing. Well, the Bible says that. He didn't start from nothing with man. He started with the dust of the earth. But this view states, why should not God, at a certain stage in the process, have taken the most developed animal and then so acted on that animal and so recreated it that while keeping the physical form so like the animals, this was a quite new and distinct creation. Now that's the view taken by such scholars as uh, Mr. Banner, who is the professor of botany in London University, who's a wonderful Christian, and others like him. I think that's a possibility. There's nothing in the scripture to exclude it, but quite frankly, I would say that while scripture can't exclude that view, I don't think it encourages it. My own view on the balance of scientific evidence and scriptural statement is that I still do believe, on balance, that God made man separately. And I have various reasons for saying that. The main one is that God could do it. Now, some months ago, I went to the cinema to see the film The Bible, in which a man set out, an Italian director set out, to put the whole Bible into a film. And uh, I think that was really asking something. He managed to get the first 22 chapters into two and a half hours. And he says he's going to do the lot, so we shall be seeing a lot more from that Italian producer. But I was intrigued. I thought, how are they going to film Genesis 1? And you know, after trying so many different ways and talking to all the scientists, he decided the best way was simply to play it as it's written. 
and simply to present it as Genesis 1 presents it. And one of the most memorable scenes is looking through the mist at a desert of dust. And through the mist you see dust coagulate into an oblong lump and gradually transform until lying there is an inert corpse into which God breathes. And the corpse sits up and stands up and looks up. It's a very dramatic and moving moment. I know it's trick photography, but God wouldn't have needed trick photography if God is almighty. And my reaction to seeing that was, why could God not have done that? And I began to wonder if people's difficulties are not really, again, as I mentioned last week, that they don't think God could. How long will it take God to develop my next body? Twinkling of an eye. From nothing. So I see no scientific or scriptural difficulty whatsoever in <coughs> holding to the simple belief that God developed the animal world and the plant world by evolution, if that becomes proved. But that on balance, I still hold to the special creation of man. Something that God did. He may have made our bodies like the higher animals. Well, that's a good thing because they were very well adapted and developed for this environment. Why shouldn't he copy that body? The point is when God made man, something new came. Something that could not have come without supernatural intervention. I would personally not feel free to be so dogmatic on this that I would have to say to someone who held the view that God took an ape's body and recreated that person into a man. I wouldn't hold that that was the wrong view. I think the Bible could allow it. But I still think on balance that both scripture and science allow me to believe that God took the dust of the earth and from the material and not the animal, but straight from the material, created man in his own image. Now let me close by going right into the Bible. I want to give you seven reasons quickly in the Bible which set man quite apart from all the animals, which say to the question, what is man? He has come from God. That he has come from down there, not from up here, even though he's made of the dust of the earth. That man belongs, as I'm going to say next week and the week after, to a fallen race, not to a rising one. That man is quite a different category to every other living thing. However intelligent my dog may be, however much I can have an elementary conversation with my dog, my dog and I are completely different creatures. Here are the seven reasons. Number one, man is the climax of creation. Even science agrees with this, that the climax and crown and peak of creation is man. Reason number two, the word created is used of man and not of the plants and the animals. And the word created, as I've shown, has this notion of something new entering into the scene. It's only used three times in Genesis 1, matter, life, and man. And therefore I think the word of God indicates something new at each stage, matter, life, and man. Third reason, before man is created, God talks to himself, which he never did before any of the other things. And the divine trinity had a conference, and they discussed what they were going to do before they made man. They didn't discuss any other part of creation. That sets man apart. Let us make man. Fourthly, in man, God reproduced himself, which he didn't do in anything else. God is not reproduced in my dog. God is not reproduced in that tree out there. God is not reproduced in those clouds. However much his creation speaks to me of his power and deity, he's not reproduced. But God says, let's reproduce ourselves now. Let's put ourselves into something. And he made man in his own image. Now, do you know, I've seen volumes three inches thick in theological libraries discussing one thing. What does the word image mean in Genesis 1? I can tell you some of the volumes if you're interested, if you want to follow it up. I think they all go much too deep into it. Let's just take it quite simply that an image is a reproduction. On the coins in my pocket are the image of sovereigns of this land. They're reproduced. Look at them, you'll see the sovereign. 
And in exactly the same way, both as individuals and together, we reproduce God. As an individual, that means two things. Not only do I have a resemblance to God, which no other part of creation has, so that people can see God in me, where they couldn't see him in anything else, but it also means that I can have a relationship with him. My dog doesn't pray. Not ashamed of that, because I don't think I could have got him to, or her to, and in fact, whenever we do pray, she seems to think that licking faces is the correct response. She has no liturgical sense at all. Dogs don't pray. No animal prays. There's no reproduction of God. And therefore, because there's no resemblance, there can be no relationship. There's nothing in common between them to make it possible. But I wonder if you realize that when God said, let us make man in our own image, he was not just saying, let's make each individual in our own image. He was saying, let's make them dependent on each other just as we are. Did you see that important message? Just as Father, Son and Spirit depend on each other and have relationships with each other, God said, let's make men in the same way so that they need each other. Let's make them male and female. Now, do you see why it immediately goes on to say, and God made man in his own image, male and female created he them. You know, it's an extraordinary fact that half the people in the world are men and half are women. Did that ever strike you as strange? It should do. I was telling someone here this week about a certain animal I discovered in a biological um, lecture has seven sexes. Seven. I just can't understand that. The complicated life they must get into. I mean, we can get into enough trouble with two, but seven sexes. It's an extraordinary fact that male and female created he then. As if he said, let us reproduce our relationships, make people need each other, make them want each other, make them capable of loving each other. And so God made man as a reproduction of himself. No other part of creation. Reason number five, God spoke to man after creating him. He never spoke to the plants. He never spoke to the animals. But when he'd made man, he said, now I can talk to you. And he talked to him. Reason number six, man was given dominion over everything else. I've given you the plants. I've given you the animals. You're to boss them as I am to boss you. You are to lord it over them. That's the meaning of the word dominion. You are to lord it over them to no other part of God's creation did God say that. And seventhly, God wrote the pattern of his own work into human nature and into no other part of his creation. The pattern of God's work is six to one. This is clearly written into Genesis and God rests in that ratio. The amazing thing is that of all nature, there is only one part of nature that has a seven-day week built in, and that, in fact, is man. I've searched everywhere in nature, and I cannot yet find a seven-day cycle in nature of work and rest. But, you know, they discovered during the French Revolution, when they tried to abolish the Christian Sunday and went for an eight-day week, that it didn't work. And during both world wars, they discovered in munition factories that the same thing applied. And I'm profoundly grateful that my wife's not here, but I can say that it applies to human nature too. Ministers only work one day in seven, by the way, that's why. <laughs> um, but I'm profoundly glad that she's not here to hear me say this. But you need one day a week off. You need that because your nature is built according to God's pattern. My dog doesn't need a Sunday. No other part of nature needs a Sunday. And when I worked on the farm and had to get up at four in the morning to milk those cows before breakfast and before getting along to church, I profoundly wished that he'd built in Sunday into every other part of creation, but he didn't. Man alone reflects God's work and is related to God's approach to creative activity. So for all these reasons, I say, man is supernaturally made. He comes from God. And if you want to ask, answer the question, what is man, you must go to answer the question, where did he come from? And if you want to answer that question, you will not get the right answer from the scientist. 
you will need to go to scripture and you'll need to see where he's coming from. There is a text in Ecclesiastes which talks of our dust returning to the earth as it was and the spirit returning to God who gave it. Science can confirm the first part but has nothing to say about the second. And if I forget that second part, then let us eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. But if I came from God, I'm going back to God and that gives me a responsibility one day to face my maker and to render my account for how I've used the life of a human being which he created in his own image. No other part of creation has this responsibility. When I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars, the work of your fingers, what is man? There's the question. That you are bothered about him, that thou art mindful of him. You have made him just a little lower than the angels. That's your place. Well above the animals and a little lower than the angels. And if you know your Bibles well, you'll know that it is your destiny one day to be above the angels and the peak of God's creation. Let us pray. Oh God, you are a wonderful God. The more we understand of your creative activity, the more we praise you. The work of your fingers. Teach us, O oh Lord, to have a balanced and open mind, a mind that is open to all truth, a mind that seeks to integrate all truth, a mind that is willing to turn thoughts into prayer and praise. We thank you for making us, for making us what we are, for making us resemble yourself and making it possible for us to talk to you now. We pray that we may be ready to listen as well as to talk and may recover again that sweet communion which Adam had in perfect fellowship with yourself. We thank you that a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came to restore that image perfectly until we fully reflect the glory of the Lord. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen.